Hi, I'm Kate Elliott. I'm back again with you for Narrative World. It's March 2022. I can't even get my head around that. And Fonda Lee is back with me today. I'm so excited. I'm back. Fonda's back. So Fonda was with me in November and we had some technical difficulties. So we decided to have Fonda back again. But also I think it's appropriate because our topic is go big or go home. So what is a building hefty stories, big stories, the biggest stories you can think of. And why wouldn't we need two sessions? Exactly. For that. Yeah, um, exactly. So before we start, um, and before I give Fonda a little bit more of a introduction, I'm just going to quickly go through my um, opening spiel, which is that the goal of this series is to dig into the idea of narrative worlds, how we build them, how we write them, and how we work. And each month a guest joins me for a, a, on some specific subject matter, which I'm starting to branch out away from world building now. And that's going to continue. We'll talk for a while and then I hope there will be questions and especially those of you today because this is our second session on this same topic. Please, please feel free to ask questions, as many questions as you want, and they can be Quite per questions that are personal to something you're working on as well. We're happy to use that as a jumping off point to talk um, about the, the issue of writing a big, big, big story. Um, I'll close the hour by mentioning forthcoming dates, guests, and the writing session that happens after this. There is an ask the question button at the bottom. That's where questions go instead of in chat. I'm not looking at chat. Nathan Lucas, our excellent tech person who is here with us again um, will be monitoring chat so if you have any questions he's the one to ask standard disclaimer this is not this is not a goal it's not a lesson it's a discussion by two professionals about their experiences so what you get out of it it might you might get something great out of it you might really not find it of interest at all it's just our talking about what we've seen and what we think. So Fonda, Fonda just finished um, a big, hefty, thematically robust trilogy called the Green Bone Saga. Um, Jade City, Jade War, Jade Legacy. Jade Legacy came out last November, 2021. Fonda's also written YA, the Exo series and Zero Boxer. Um, do you want to add anything, Fonda? No, that's pretty much it. That's pretty much it. Um, and Fonda and I have talked a little bit about this whole issue of writing big books because the Green Bone Saga is a big series. It's a trilogy that functions completely as a trilogy. So I wanted to ask you what I asked you last time, and maybe you'll have kind, a kind of a slightly different take on how you approach it is, what is a big book or a big thematic story to you? Mm. I, I just want to say, because to me, it's not just a lot of words. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, if I, you had asked me this question a few years ago, I would have gone to the examples in my mind of epic fantasy stories that include you know, a big kind of uh, world changing conflict of some sort. You know, uh, this, the fate of this country is being decided or, um, you know, it's a big good versus evil showdown. And um, I would have evoked kind of, you know, the, the things that you imagine um, when you think of an epic like Lord of the Rings, right? Like uh, lots of characters, lots of, of, um, of historically important um, moments, mythology, etc. But I just came off of writing this, this trilogy uh, that was, you know, three big hefty volumes um, and that did not include a gargantuan um, world ending stakes. There was no apocalyptic, uh, you know, theme. There was no good versus evil. So I wrote an epic fantasy trilogy that did not have some of those things that you might first reach to when you think of what is a big story. Um, and instead I have a story that spans 
um, the a generation and, and is focused much more on those characters, but it has a large cast of characters. It has a lot of things that happen over time. And I look back on the trilogy now having finished it with a sense of um, this, with the realization that you can find epic even in a single life. And that's something that um, I don't think I would have, uh, you know, really understood um, before I wrote the trilogy. And so now I think of what is a big story in terms of um, the canvas that you're working on. And that canvas can be large, but there are different ways to make it large. So you can, you can tell a large story um, that's, uh, that has a lot of uh, characters and, is, and feels very big because you're diving into so many different points of view. But you can also have a large story with a single point of view and you're taking the reader through that person's entire life. You can have, an you can have a, lar a story that feels large because um, the stakes are so enormous and you have a, a perspective of the world um, that you might not have if you have a, you know, a tighter, more focused story. So I still think of a, of a big story uh, as being one in which um, you're working with a, 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 a bigger paintbrush, if you will, um, as a writer. But I think that there are different ways to tell a big story than just maybe the easy answer of it has to be a big showdown between good versus evil forces and the fate of the world in the balance. I, you know, this is fascinating, partly because I agree with you so much and you've said it so well, but also because my own thinking has gone through kind of the, that I have myself struggled with these ideas. So I wrote a seven volume epic fantasy. And the core piece of it is that there is literally an apocalyptic event in it that happened, I wrote this so long ago, <laughs> happened at the end of book five. And then the consequences roll on mm -hmm. through the last two books. Um, but because at that time, I thought if you're really gonna write an epic fantasy, there has to be the ring or the world has to end or, you know, the dark Lord rises or whatever, one of those things. But then over time, as I began to wrote, write other things that I think of as being also epic, that that idea that there has to be an apocalypse is that that began to recede, especially mm -hmm. that specific idea of apocalypse, like you yes. say, I mean, yeah. in a way, we could say that a person has this life that spans 60 years or 80 years. And there is a kind of an apocalypse when the life ends, right? Because that is ended for them. But that's not, it doesn't have the same, it's, it's, that, it's that thing where you're juggling, what does that mean? What is, what is important enough thematically mm -hmm. to treat as if mm -hmm. it's this big and this important? And I think it's whatever, however we choose to look at it and frame it. Yes. We can frame things in different ways than what we were originally told. Right. Right. And it, it's almost that you recognize it when you see it. Um, it's, yeah. it's kind of an intuitive sense for me because I, I certainly felt like as I was closing out the Greenbone saga that there were scenes and moments that just felt so um, impactful and resonant because they were, they were calling back to things that had happened in the beginning of the first book. And there was this sense of this journey that had happened, this large journey that was coming to a close. And you can take the reader on any number of different types of journeys, but if at the end you leave them with this feeling like, wow, you know, this was not just a trip to the grocery store. This was a whole road trip, you know, that, that you took them on um, and that they are, that they're, they're changed for it in some way that the characters and hopefully the reader um, have have really uh, stepped into a, a large experience. Then I I think that that in itself qualifies in some way as being epic. Um, and uh, 
and and yeah, it doesn't it it, it doesn't have to be um, world ending, but it can be world changing for those characters. Um, and so there's they're very much for me now is a like I'll know it when I see it. I I'm absolutely fascinated by this because one of the things I I, I agree with you. Um, also with the, I know it when I see it, because I do sometimes pick up something that says this is epic. And I think, you know what, this is fine. It's excellent, right, but it's not right. epic. Yes. Yeah. But, but there's something you said in there, this idea of a journey, but even more than that to me in terms of, and I want to get back to this idea of conceptualization, because for me personally, I feel like I can't write an epic unless I've conceptualized it that way from the beginning, because otherwise the story that's in my head isn't, it, 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 it fits into the creation, like the, the bowl I made for it, let's right. say, or the basket. Right. Um, but so I actually want to talk about those two things. Um, these two things, one is this idea of conceptualization and, and beginning with that. And then the other is this idea of connection because mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. the richer the net of connections, the, the richer and the bigger the story gets. And these callbacks to me are one of the things that make books feel epic and stories mm -hmm, feel mm -hmm. epic that I'm reading book four of Ken Liu's Dandelion Dynasty, that this is the, the final book in it. And there's so much in it yes. that is a callback to earlier things or that builds on my understanding of earlier things as opposed to, it's, it's almost like a thing about levels, right? Yes, like everything yeah. is just a, a bead on a string. And there's no call. And when you're down here, there's no call back to there. It's like you left everything behind. Then I, and there's not, again, there's nothing wrong with that kind of story. Those can be great stories, but I don't feel it's mm -hmm, that sense of mm -hmm. connection, that dense web of how right. things relate. Right. Um, anyway, do, do you yes, have any yes to all of that. And I think that is the difference between a series that might have just as long of a word count in totality, but that is written episodically and that you would yeah. not call an epic because even if it, let's say it has seven volumes, but each of those volumes are sort of are self-contained and they're, they're episodic and the characters reset, you know, after, after each book, that can be a very long series but I wouldn't classify it as an epic. And you can get, you can have an epic that is a shorter number of words, but that has a structure to it that uh, has a, that builds to a scale that gives you that sense of epicness. And so I, I agree with you. It's sort of the web, the interweaving and the, the drawing of connections between characters and themes and events and the, um, in the story that create that sense. It's like the architecture of the thing, which I think gets back to what you were saying yeah. around, you have to conceptualize it from the beginning that way. Um, but I'm, I wonder about that. And there's a question in my mind as to um, where that conceptualization happens and whether it has to happen right at the beginning. For me, it does happen relatively early on. Um, my, and and perhaps because I, uh, I am one of those writers who needs to have a plan, I need to know where the story is going in order to, be, to write that. But um, I've been watching a lot of anime. And one of the things that um, is, is interesting, I'm currently watching the final season of Attack on Titan. And that is a story that becomes epic in scope, but does not start out that way. When you first start watching it, you're like, oh, this is a great action show about uh, humans fighting titans these giants flesh-eating giants and like this is going to be fun and, and cool and um then it just grows and it becomes the these reveals make the world bigger and bigger and of course i haven't can't talk to the creator of the series to to yes. um find out at what point they conceptualized it as such but um but I would be curious to know whether or not it was a case where they always knew the world would get this big and the story would get that epic. 
And they started with the small piece that brought the reader in and then gradually expanded it and made the reader open their eyes to bigger and bigger pieces, or whether it was an organic expansion process for the writer as well, where right, it right. just kept layering on until it became epic. And I think both are possible, but I, I believe, and perhaps this is my bias, that it is harder to do um, when it is harder to make and to, to retrofit an epic. You know, it's harder yeah, to, yeah. to start with a smaller scale thing and then make it bigger and bigger um, as opposed to conceptualizing it. And you can start with a smaller piece. You can be like, here's where I eventually want to get to. And, but this is where I'm going to enter and I'm going to build off there. a, But It strikes I'm, me that there's a fluidity there too, right? That right. if you can, if you, there's a difference between saying, and when I say the beginning, I don't mean like I sit down and say, I'm going to write, you know, this epic. I mean, it, the, the beginning for me can last two or three years, right? Right, of right. Things churning in my head. I don't even know. But, but I think that some setups lend themselves to that opening. They're like yes. a flower bud and they can open, whereas other setups feel more static. And I don't know right. even how to explain or possibly understand it it's just that some book setups feel static enough that I feel like they can only get so big yes. whereas maybe I haven't seen Attack on Titan but um but there are there's like maybe there's just space in there yes yeah yeah and I think also potentially a sense of curiosity oh I love that because there are some stories that are, by the nature of their structure, inherently enclosed, right? Like I think a, um, a locked room mystery or a contemporary romance, right? Where yeah. to deliver on the story that you are planning, you will end with a closed door. You're, you're going to deliver the happily ever after or the, the, the mystery, the, you know, the answer to who, who done it. Um, and then there are stories that are always going, that, that lend themselves to the potential for asking more questions. Like you, and I think this is why our genre of science fiction and fantasy yeah. Yeah. is so uh, populated with these epic stories because we are inherently creating, uh, we're always creating new worlds. And even if we have a relatively small story that we're envisioning just by creating the world that this story is going to live in we are uh, we're inviting questions right we're inviting people to ask yes. like well yeah well well that's that's cool but what happens when this or but what about this other character or like but what about that other continent that's just kind of not filled in on the map you know so there's there's that potential to um, to keep asking the but but questions that then open more doors that allow you to have that flower bud opening. You know, it's interesting because this this idea of a closed door, which is not a negative thing, it's no. a it's a completion. Right. The doors closed. The story's over. We we know where we are, and I sometimes see that as a criticism of stories like say some of mine because. I tend to always leave some things hanging because I don't believe things are tidally ended in the world that are in our lives. I agree. And I sometimes see, not that I try to avoid reviews, but sometimes I can't help myself. I don't know. It was a bad day and I needed chocolate and some we've kind of word. There. I, yeah, we've all been there. <laughs> um, but it's like, well, sh she left too many questions unanswered or it wasn't neatly sewn up. Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. some genres have that expectation or some subgenres have that expectation, which is what, which is one of the things that makes them satisfying. Right. Right. But one of the things about an epic is I think overall to me, epics also leave that sense of more is going to happen. It's just right. going to happen right. off stage now. Right. Yes. I couldn't agree more. And I've seen the same sort of reactions to my work because I don't, I don't go for that tidy bow at the end either. I there am very much the 
the end of the end of Jade Legacy. I mean, it, I, you know, I'm critical about my epics, but the end of Jade Legacy is just, it just, I'm sorry. It's so right. I'm going to fangirl here a minute. It is <laughs> so right. Anyway, sorry. Thank you. Because, but I, it, I, it, 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 because some things are resolved and yes. other things can't ever be resolved. Right. They're just left there. Right. And it's more like, it, it's like if you're watching a documentary film, right? you're it's not like let's say it's a it's a documentary film about some some very large theme or subject you don't expect all the answers at the end yeah. you expect yeah. a conclusion but that's like this is where the filmmaker stopped filming you know right. these characters these people that you've been following around with a the camera they don't stop existing they're continuing this is just where we stopped filming them and that's right. kind of the same approach that yeah. I take with, with stories because I very much want readers to feel like these people are, and this world is real and I just stopped writing about them. But there's, you know, and, yeah. and sometimes yeah. you will get the readers who are like, yeah, but you never answered the question of whether these two people got together or whether, you know, where they, where they went afterwards or what happened to this person. I'm like, Oh, that's what fan fiction is for. You know, like that's it's exactly you know, you a three guys are cut up our own. It's out there. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> happening. I just, I didn't write about it. So I, and I think that actually is also a tool that potentially um, uh, contributes to the sense of scale, right? Is this, this yes. feeling of like, there, there is more, there is more and you could, there's more to exploit. Um, and that, and I'm sure you get these same questions too. Of like, oh, are you going to write a, are you going to write a spinoff series? Are you going to write a prequel? Are you going to write a sequel trilogy? And like, and and I think uh, even when the answer is no, because I have other projects to work on, even when the answer is no, the the fact that that possibility exists and that readers can ask that question is a sign that I've succeeded in creating that that sense of of scale and, and yeah, you know, epic reality. I, because one of the other things that it is this idea that not just at the end of the story that there could be more to write, but also during the story, that sense of whether you are only seeing, you know, you're, you're running down a road and there's, there's, um, there's your, your buildings to either side and that's, but there's nothing behind them. Right. Right. And, and that's all there is to see, but to me in a story, and this isn't, this isn't just about epics. This isn't just happen in epics, but I think it yeah. has to happen in an epic Yes, for an epic to have that big feel, which is that sense that there's other stuff going on in the world at the same time. We're yes. just only seeing this because it has to be boiled down to these points of view. Right. Um, so there's always that sense of there's more out yes. there. And I love doing that with secondary characters. Yeah. The idea that maybe this secondary character is just showing up for one chapter. But if I can, if I can give the reader the impression that after this chapter ends, the secondary character has a whole other life you know, they're, that they're, they don't exist just for the purpose of, of this plot advancing, but that uh, you, can, you can draw them in with enough of a sense of interest or unanswered questions to them uh, that the reader can imagine, oh yeah, like they, they, there's a whole other thing that's going on with this character or in this other setting or in this other yeah, country yeah, yeah. Uh, and that i i think gets back to your okay there's threads out there like we've connected this thread in here but this the web extends past your field of view they, they yeah they've moved in and this actually gets into the they, they've moved into the the purview of right. the plot or the purview right. of the main character or the purview of the thematic elements um and this kind of gets into this thing of how do you how do you write it how do how does one write a ep, an epic trilogy or an epic series or even just an epic standalone novel, which can also happen? Um, I don't know. How do we how do we? I mean, I start to some extent again with this idea of conceptualization, where I need to know how how 
big that that space needs to be in my head. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. But that's pretty, a pretty nebulous way to start. What do you like? Can you talk a little bit about your conceptualization and then how you worked through and developed the, the, the Jade City books? Oh, you know, it's so funny to look back on it because there definitely is that part of you that's like, how did I do that? (laughs) What was I thinking? So, you know, like somehow it happened, but how? Um, But I I mean, if I try to describe it, I would say um, there's, uh, I I need to know what the center of the canvas is. So even if like the canvas is large, I need to know, okay, what, what's kind of the, the focal point of this this panorama that I'm going to paint, but what, what's kind right. of the, where do I want the, the, the attention of the reader? So um, what for me, uh, what allowed me to write this trilogy was knowing that the focal point was this family and that I wasn't going to try and cover everything that was happening in the world because that is the struggle oftentimes with these epic stories is, well, they're epic, they're huge. So yeah. there, there could be everything, anything, right? You could have, I mean, what do you even focus on? <laughs> That's why I wrote seven books in that trilogy. Exactly. Yeah, exa- yeah, exactly. Like you could just keep going. And, and that can be very overwhelming as a writer. When you even conceive of an epic, it seems like it's just too huge to even... Uh, th- to, to, to hold in your own mind. It's like saying, I'm going to, you know, circumnavigate the globe and like, do you even start? So um, for me, I, I drew a, a, a focus um, point and that was this family. And then I kind of said, okay, well, what are the, where does this story take them in terms of like, how does, how do I create that sense of scale and epicness on different levels? So um, for the first book, it was, okay, this, this family and this, this interclan war that they're embroiled in, and we kind of understand the nation, this island that they live on and, and how the clans work and the conflict that they have. And then I'm going to expand that and let you see more of the world. And now we've got geopolitical um, intrigue and and there's more time that passes so you see more there and then the third book now you're you're expanding even further because you're seeing years pass and the change in society and the generational shift and technological shifts and so it was kind of saying okay here's where i'm going to start and then here's the layers that i'm going to build on top of it and where am i not going to go so, you know, I've had people say, well, why didn't you write, you know, a whole separate, you know, point of view from the antagonist clan's uh, perspective? And I could have done that, but I, I right. decided that right. I had to, you have to figure out where you're not going to go. So I wasn't going to go there. Um, you know, I didn't want to have a whole side story involving a uh, jade being used in like all the, in, in Iguton, this all their whole other right, country. Right. So like I had, there are places I could have gone and I didn't. Um, so some combination of being ambitious in scope, but also drawing your lines. Because I think that for me, it was the only way I could write something that was epic, but that actually finished because that was very important to me. <laughs> I'm finishing this trilogy. You know, it's interesting because I've I've done um, all kinds of things in my life. I remember when I was working on Crown of Stars, I knew who the three main characters, point of view characters were. And then mm-hmm. there were other point of view characters, some, I mean, other major characters, some of whom had a point of view, were secondary points of view, some of who weren't, but were so important to the plot. And I remember writing these long lists of all the things and they would like sometimes go on for two pages of all the things that either they were dealing with or that they were going to do. Um, I think that they were meant to kind of be chronological according to the story, although sometimes they might have been out of order. And 
so by the time and and they would get added to it as I was working on it, but I always had an extensive sense of what these characters goals were what the maybe events that would happen to them ways they would react it was it was and those because I had written all those down mm -hmm. they grounded me when mm -hmm. because I always I knew the people and I knew right. what they're what they wanted I mean and that was how I did crown of stars but I haven't done I actually haven't done that again because it was a lot um, and maybe because it got too diffuse. Um, I'm not sure. I know that I'm working on the space opera now on Conquerable Sun, and it's easy because it's the story of, I mean, as I say, it's gender, right. gender swapped Alexander the Great in space. But the thing is, is that Alexander the Great is this kind of, this kind of black hole, right? Right. In which, that, uh, in which you know, you sit Alexander the Great or his armor after he's dead, because he died young, that's not a spoiler, um, on his throne. And either he's there or his armor is there, but everything right, right. rotates around that. And yeah, so yeah, yeah. that's the organizing principle yes. for this very large and ambitious series. Yeah. But it yeah. still all has to, it can't go outside that. And I can have points of view, and I do have in the second book, I have points of view where it's a, like a one-off point of view. Yeah from someone who's being affected by what's going on. And it's the only time you see that. And it gets mm -hmm, a sense mm -hmm. of how this, how ambition yes. affects everything is, you know, oh, someone's got, gotten pulled into that. But again, it's always around there. So that was my organizing principle for, yeah. or that is my, that continues to be, I'm still working on it. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I have to write book three now. <laughs> Two's not. Um, so yeah, finding some kind of a whatever that organizing principle is. Um, I like your idea of a focal point. Mm -hmm. um, I do tend mm -hmm. to know what the end is, or maybe not the exact end, but an end place or an end feeling or an end aesthetic. Right. Um, right. One thing I think um, that we both sort of uh, touched on or hinted at is this idea of you know you, you've got an organizing principle and that that focal point has to have enough gravity to it that yes. it kind of yes bends space and time and other people toward it and so you're you're naturally capturing a lot of stuff because your focal point is so compelling right like alexander the great as a human being it just has yeah. such an, a, a, an important had so much touched so much stuff had such a yeah. huge impact that choosing that as a focal point thus allowed you to reach out in all sorts of different ways. Um, and I, I was, it was interesting because you said you made this list. And I, at one point I did a mind map where I had all the main characters and they were you know, each doing their own thing, but I was drawing lines between them. So it looked like oh, yeah, you know, yeah. that, that, that meme where you've got the, the, the guy in front of the wall with all the string and the notes. So it looked like that because I had these, the, each of the POV characters and what they were up to and how it hooked into different things that were going on in the world. And then draw, I drew lines of like relationship between them and like how they were all interacting. So I, I was like, okay, I haven't seen, there hasn't been a chapter with these two characters yet. Can I get them both in the same scene so I can draw a connection between what they're both doing? You know, so that sort of, a, that's a mind a, mapping can be really helpful sometimes. That's a great trick. Do you did you did you do that on a program or did you do that on a little physical like whiteboard or? I actually uh, did a the, physical like got a big one of those easel sized post it notes and covered mm -hmm. my wall with and literally drew. Um, but I think there are programs that people can use too. I I can't recall the name of it off the top of my head. But there, I'm, there are. I'm just I'm tactile, so I need. Yeah, me too. I need a physical thing. I have a whiteboard, which I'll sometimes line up. If I need to, I will line up like the say the let's, let's say the three main characters, and then a, and a line, and then I'll list major events that happen, and and then I'll make sure that you see how where they connect. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes that helps me if I have to weave together multiple points of view. Yeah. Um, I had a book in which I had a bunch of 
chapters early on from one character. And then I wrote, I did this big, massive whiteboard outline. And I realized I needed to take like half of those chapters and move them later and weave them together because there were too many. I actually like was saying, I made a list of chapters. Who's the point of view here? And it went, you know, X, 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 Z, X, X, C, X, X. And I said, okay, X needs to spread out. So sometimes yeah. just tricks like that help yeah, you yeah. Get, a, get a view of it. Yes. Yeah. You do feel like, um, you know, almost like you're playing, I don't know, Sim City or something like with your, with your own manuscript, right? Um, because, uh, you know, I have a similar thing I did where I would color code each of my scenes by like their point of view. And um, I, I would also mark them things like, you know, is this a, a, a action scene, a dialogue heavy scene, you know, a family scene. I would try and like identify them or, or mark them by different characteristics right. so right. that I could step back and look at them and be like, okay, no, I've had like three scenes with this point of view character in a row, or I've had two heavy action scenes too close together. I need to spread them out yeah. or, you know, things like that. So I'm we have sort of a question oh. for you before we, we grab that um, yeah. one in our chat. Um, we've yeah. both done YA and adult yeah. fiction. Did you find that when you were, when you were doing YA fiction that you thought about epic themes and stories differently than the adult side? Uh, well, yeah, because if I had written Court of Fives as an adult novel, it would have been twice as long. <laughs> there were, there's a whole sequence of events that happens in book three that just happens off stage. Right, Be right. Because I, I kept, in that case, my organizing principle was that it had to happen to the main character. Right. And that there were things that I just couldn't go into because they would expand it too much. And because yeah. I had... I didn't, I, well, because they had to be a hundred thousand words or less. Yeah. 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 So how about you? Yeah. Similar in that, um, there were a lot of things like in the exo duology, for example, mm -hmm. everything is happening through the point of view of this one teenage character. So you, the, the adult writer in you is like, Oh, like that would be, you know, interesting to explore or like you know that there's all this other stuff that's going on but you're filtering it all through like a very narrow it's almost like you you you're funneling what you can through this one protagonist pov um and that in its nature kind of constrains you but is also refreshing challenge because you can't go too far um with with your with your canvas well, well, let me say that I have also written, so Court of Fives is a single point of view, first person story um, that was as epic as I could make it, um, given that there were things that I left out that I wouldn't have left out if it had been an adult novel. But I've also right. written the Spirit Walker trilogy, which is a first person point of view novel. And it is, it gets pretty darn big um, because I never had to, I, I can't, I, I mean, I, I, I confess I indulged myself a bit and why not? Because we only live once. Right? That's right. It's your book. You can do and what it's, you want. It's my book. Right. Um, but, but so I was able to include things that in a more tightly curated young adult novel, I wouldn't have. Mm -hmm. um, and that I think allowed me, for example, to write my version of Waterloo, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, from this, it, in a way that I just couldn't have. Um, and so again, the, the, it was, it was, it's contained by having, it can only be what this character witnesses, but if she's moving around a lot, right. um, then, and traveling. And doesn't have to be 16. And doesn't have to be 16, <laughs> right? I mean, she's not, she's in her early 20s, but, <laughs> right. but it, it, yeah, um, it, it changes what you can do. So yeah. I do think that there can be those other constraints. Yeah. Let's tackle this actually. Yeah. Excellent. An excellent question from GJ. You both seem to associate large world building and large themes with epic storytelling. 
can't it be done differently? Um, and I do think Fonda that you were talking about how different canvases, there's lots of different canvases on which that we can create an epic. Um, I think about Cordwainer Smith, who did large world building and large themes, but through a lot of smaller works, um, or maybe you don't agree. I'm not sure epic is necessary. Oh, I don't think, okay, so I'm not sure I'm understanding and please feel free to, um, to, to clarify. I don't think epic is necessary to deal with large world building and large mm -hmm. themes. I've read short stories that had yeah. big, profound themes in them that were very focused, that I wouldn't mm -hmm. call mm -hmm. epic, but that I would call big mm -hmm. and large and as big as anything I've read in a novel. I agree. Um, yeah, I mean, I exactly. I've read, you know, these tight little Ted Chang stories that pack oh. more ideas and themes into like a yeah. single short story than most. Yeah trilogies you know could have so absolutely form uh does is not a constraint here when it comes to um big themes and and big worlds i think um we are talking a lot of epic uh storytelling because that's what we do right like the two of us uh, are, are right are are uh f fond of of large epic epic storytelling um but absolutely you can have um, large themes and ideas in, in very tight packages. You can have a single, you can have them through single POV. You can, I, I mean, I don't think uh, there's any um, restriction on how you tackle big themes. It's, it's more of a, of the, it's, it's more that epic fantasy has to have those themes. So you can you can tell big themes and big ideas in a short story, uh, but you don't have to. Well, I feel like if you're going to commit to to a, a, a large, um, you know, volume of doorstopper novels, uh, you're you're gonna really run out of stuff to say until unless you have some big themes and and big ideas and and um, directions to go in mind. Yeah, I would completely agree. Some of the most profoundly huge human themes I've ever read have been in small packages, in single, maybe very short novels, or, or I mean, Ted Chiang's a great example. <laughs> you know, The Story of Your Life, which is an amazing um, novelette, I think. It might be a novella. I'm not sure, but it asks just such, it asks such a deeply profound question um i can barely think of a more as a parent i can barely think of a greater question that it asks mm -hmm. um and um so yeah i don't think that those i don't think that's restricted epic isn't well large themes aren't restricted to epics yeah at all. yeah we're just I, we just write we're just writing exactly them. yeah you're just you're just happen to be talking to us um but i mean we're also epic is both a uh I mean, it's both a subgenre and it's also a descriptor, right? Like that we're, so we're, we're, when we say epic fantasy, we're also describing like a, a subgenre with certain conventions to it. Well, it's like epic is also a descriptor that you can apply to, you know, a whole number of things, including short stories. So we're, we're kind of working on yeah. two levels of what epic means in this case. Yeah. And I also think that there's, there's also an idea that, that, I think there's an argument to be made that when we talk about epic literature, we're often talking about the early literatures of um, societies that are stories about the cosmogony and about the creation right. of these societies about early heroes. Um, you know, Gilgamesh is an epic. I don't know how long it is compared to other things. You know, Homer is wrote epics. Um, the Shanama is an epic, and those are mm -hmm. about that that way of looking at epic is kind of like how do things how did these things come to be how did they develop mm -hmm. they're they're about mm -hmm. the rootedness um of a the rootedness and the foundational aspects of um some given culture and right. we see those worldwide um that's a again but that's a little de definitionally a little different um and Anyone listening, if you have other questions, especially if you have specific questions reflecting something you're working on um, and how to tackle it, please feel free to ask. This yes. is the space. 
this is your chance otherwise we will just chance. keep talking and we can, yeah <laughs> we can do that but you're here so yeah by all means yeah. use this um i have more questions but do you have anything that you have really been wanting to talk about with with epic oh wait wait oh, there's another one yeah yeah, yeah. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, you talked about readers asking whether you'd write more, but when you're getting your toes wet in a new world you're developing, do you ever try it out in a small form, like write a short story to work out an idea or a set of relationships? Uh, yes. I've, I've, well, that's complicated. I often will write the beginning of something and then set it aside for a long time. Um, and then come back to it. I'm not sure how often I've written an actual short story, but that has to do partly with the fact that I don't write many short stories um, and I'm not, it's not a form that's comfortable with me, but I think it's, but I, I try out things in shorter segments, like scenes. For people mm -hmm. who write short stories, I think it's a great way. Um, yeah. What do you think? I am the same in that um, everything, 96% of my ideas come to me as a novel. And so it would actually be more work for me to figure yeah. it out as a short story than yeah. to just go straight into writing a novel. So no, I have not yet written a short story first as a test drive to a novel because that actually strikes me as harder. But that's just me because I'm, I'm not a, a naturally inclined to be a, a short story writer. I'm, I'm, a novel is very much my natural length. However, I have seen plenty of other writers take this approach um, with great success. So I think it could absolutely be done. What I do is I will do a lot of freeform brainstorming where I will write little snippets or a little mm. like just yeah. train of thought, brain dumps, where I might put like two of the characters in a room and brainstorm something between them or I might have um I might just tell myself a story about how this world came to be so I will have just like me being you know the the stuff that would never show up in the novel but is just me figuring it out um and that's kind of what I think of as the um the, the, the getting the toes wet, as, as you say, um, because just sitting down and immediately knowing everything and trying to turn it into a story is, is, is daunting. Um, I like the, and, and I will at times do the write the beginning and then let it sit for a while or shelve it for a little bit until I have cogitated on it a little bit more. Um, but uh, I, I think oftentimes it, it is a very good idea to, to work some of that stuff out either in the background or in these sort of test drive kind of ways. Yeah, yeah I, I, I don't ever like sit down and spend two or three months, and this is just how I work. I don't sit down and spend two months and devise everything and then start working. It's a right. long process. It usually... The, the process for me takes a year, two years, three years, where I'm going back and forth. I think about something and I make some notes, then I work on something else, you know, and then, but then while I'm working on that other thing, periodically I'll go, oh, wait, you know, maybe it could start like this, you know, or maybe this scene could happen, mm -hmm. or I'll write some, you know, something um, as if from the literature of the time, and then I'll go away from it again. And then over time, that kind of accretes you know and it mm -hmm, develops mm -hmm. layers um, I it's very rare for me to write an opening scene that is the scene that ends up at the opening of the final published novel that's right. I I it's vanishingly rare for me to do that usually I'm playing with other things um, I will say that Servant Mage which is the novella that just came out from Tor.com in in January it's actually a novella written um, on from a idea that an idea that I was developing 10 years ago that I never wrote out. I wrote beginnings of it and I have it partially outlined. Um, and then it kind of stalled out because I was working on other things became more important. Um, and then later I decided to go back and think about really thinking about the magic 
how magic worked in this place. And that turned into Servant Mage. So mm -hmm. now it's published, but right. that other story could still be written and is actually a bigger, longer book than Servant Mage, which is a novella. Um, right. So maybe that, I mean, so who knows, right? So, but that's yeah. kind of an example of, of using a shorter piece to teach myself something. Um, writing yeah. is weird. It is, it's weird. It's so interesting that you said that because the Tor.com novel that I have coming out next year is a, yeah. is a story that I wrote about, oh, almost 30,000 words of a novel for back before I had written the Greenbone Saga. And I got busy on the Greenbone Saga and I set this 30,000 word thing aside being like, I don't know what I'm gonna do with this. <laughs> and then after I wrote literally an entire epic trilogy, I came back to it. It was like, huh, I bet this would make a good novella. And, you know, tore it down to its studs and rewrote it as a novella. <laughs> so See? writing is weird like that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And it, it, what's weird to me is how we learn things from each book we write yes. that helps us write the next thing only often in unexpected ways, completely unexpected ways. Yeah, yeah. Because the novella that I wrote is complete, it would be, would have been a complete, is now completely different than whatever novel that other thing might have turned into. Right. Seven right. years ago. <laughs> right. I think it's hard to hold on to things for that long yeah. unless they're already in, um, this is hard to explain. I think oftentimes an idea that I had 10 or 15 years ago that was just right at that moment, mm -hmm. 10 years will pass mm -hmm. and it's not right anymore. Right. Or what's right about it is a different angle than I would have, than I would have yes. done then. Um, yes because that's just the nature of how things change around us. And also how we change as people yeah. and as writers. Yeah. The things that you know, are occupying our minds and that are really compelling to us at one point in our lives are different at another point in our lives and we kind of have to meet them where we are. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyone else? I know you're there. I know you have a question. You, yes, you have a question because we have seven we can, minutes we can see you we can see you well we can't actually see you we well, can just right. see nathan's we know name we know that you're yeah. there yeah nathan could even ask a question since he doesn't get enough fun and i were just discussing that he doesn't get enough uh credit for doing the tech on these him and cj who's done a yes. couple um Thank, thanks to them for thanks to for them yeah because otherwise i would not be here um Okay, do you have something else that you want to talk about in terms of big books? Hmm. What does it feel like to be, what does it feel like to be done? Oh my goodness. I mean, besides like, oh my gosh, I did it. <laughs> so, so, right, so there's the relief. There's, there's that for sure. Um, and there is also a sadness. I mean, there, it, it is really, um, it, it's sad to leave characters in a, in a world that you've become so attached to that you know so yeah. well. It does yeah. almost feel like you close this chapter on your life and you are picking up and moving somewhere else. Um, and uh, it, it is, it's hard to, um, to work on something new, like to be, you know, totally frank, you, you start something new and you're like, I don't know these people what's going on here yeah. <laughs> uh, so um after i finished the Greenbone saga i spent a bunch of time writing some shorter things because it was a great way to reset my brain so I, I finished that trilogy and then i wrote a novella and then i wrote another novella and then i wrote three short stories so i've been working on short stuff and i'm i'm just now starting to work on the next big project and it's 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 a strange feeling um, but you know, it, there, there's something to be said for just that, uh, that sense of like, oh, like the, 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 the weight kind of coming off yeah. your shoulders that you've been carrying and you don't realize, you know, that you, you have been, uh, I mean, you, you live with it for years. We live with these stories and these characters yeah. for years and like years before we even start writing it. Yeah. Yeah. 
I, you know, actually, there's something we said before we started the actual recording, um, which is sometimes I think, and I know you went through this with possibly book two, but particularly book three is like, is this too long? Will people go with me? Is it too big? Is there too many words? And, and um, you said something that I think is really important, which is that in the end, we're the ones who have to live with it. Yeah. And we're the ones who have to say in the end, this is what I wanted to write at this length. It said what I wanted to say. We don't be when we give it up, it's gone. Yeah. We don't, we don't judge how it worked, but we judge for ourselves. Um, and I'm saying that in part because the second book of the um, Unconquerable Sun series is really, really long. Um, and I have asked myself that, is it too long? But you know what? It's what I wanted to say. Yeah. 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 And in the end, I have to live with, you know, it's, I'm the one I have to live with. Right. Um, yeah. Do you have that? Have, have you had that sense? Did you worry about that? I, you know, I did and I didn't. Um, in so far as you're always plagued by doubts when, you, right. when you're writing, especially, you know, that we are finishing a, a, a trilogy and you feel like, oh gosh, this is, this is it. Like I've got to stick the landing on it. Um, and so, so yes, but also no, in that I also felt like, look, anyone who's come with me this far, you know, they're, they're already invested and they're, they're, they're going to get what they're going to get, you know? And like they, and, right. and they've come, if the hope, if they've come with this, this, with me this far, hopefully they will come with me a little further. And um, like you said, like there is, there's no one who has to uh, spend this much time in the world and with these characters than we do. And at the, uh, to maintain your motivation, even just through the process of putting all these words down, you have to be working towards something that you're happy with, that you feel like, yeah, it, it, I, I did what I set out to do and I'm proud of, of what I accomplished. And this is something that I can open on my shelf and be like, yes, like this is what I wanted to say. And I said it. So um, you kind of have to hold both of those in your mind at any given time, like be like, okay, well, you know, I have, I have certain considerations that I have to, um, I have to live with like you know what what is my publisher going to accept and how, when 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 oh, like how far can I stretch this deadline you know like there are yeah, yeah, those yeah, yeah. practical yeah. considerations yeah. and then yeah. there are you know the artistic considerations and you have to find a way to make sure that that both are satisfied absolutely I I and I think that's a great note to end on um Thank you, Fonda. It Thank was you. great, um, great. And I hope people find this conversation useful. Next month on April 24th will be Martha Wells. And we're going <gasps> to, I know she wants to, <laughs> she wants to talk about um, avoiding the monoculture in, yeah. Yeah. And then May is Saladin Ahmed, who's going to talk about it's either new wine, old bottles or old bottles, new wine. I think it's old bottles, new wine, <laughs> not new wine, old bottles. Never mind. Okay. No, wait, that was just reverse. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. And that's um, May 8th, May 18th. Oh, those um, both sound fantastic. They, yeah, it's going to be great. Um, I want to thank everybody who is here live. I want to thank all of you who are watching this on YouTube later. I want to thank Fonda for being with me today. Nathan for doing tech again. Sifwa for providing the platform. And for those of you who are here, there's a writing date um, session next with Claire O'Dell um, on, in a different room on the Nebula conference platform. Um, and I hope to see you all next month. So thank you. Thank you, everyone.